Thank you very much indeed, Madam Chair, Mrs. Gressler, uh, Mrs. Ayala Senda, Rapporteur, Committee Members, Commissioner. I haven't seen him. Uh, I'm sure he'll be here. Well, I'll wo welcome him already. Ladies and gentlemen, as a former member, I'm aware that for the European Parliament, this is a very intensive phase of work. Not just uh, is um, Parliament working at full revs to get existing legislation onto the statute books, but also in the run-up to the election uh, phase, uh, it is a high-level forum for debate of the future of Europe. And we saw that yesterday embodied in the visit of the Prime Minister of Estonia. And so, as President of the Court of Auditors, it's all the more incumbent on me to thank you as a committee for making the time available for the debate of our annual report for 2017. Mr. Lazarou uh, was the member responsible for the annual report, and the members uh, responsible for each of the ten, year, ten different chapters have all uh, put considerable effort into giving you our appreciation of the state of the EU's financial management in 2017, and that will lead to the start of the discharge procedure. I'm a generalist, and I can't uh, answer all of the specific questions. For that, you should turn to uh, the members who wrote uh, those specific chapters. This is the last uh, discharge procedure under this Parliament. I'd like to thank the Commission uh, which is the main auditee, for engaging with us. Our audit process finishes with what is called an adversarial procedure, but we are not adversaries. The court is often critical and sometimes stubborn, but I do hope we're always fair and open to reasonable explanations, uh, which uh, are watertight, and, of course, you can complete your own picture by reading the Commission's observations. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2017, as in past years, we have concluded that the EU's accounts are a true, fair picture of the financial position of the EU. Like last year, we are giving a qualified opinion, not an adverse opinion, on the regularity of the payments underlying the 2017 accounts. That's the second time in a row that we've done that. To put it differently, a substantial part of the expenditure in 2017 that we have examined was not materially affected by error. And I'm referring here to expenditure based on um, entitlements or commitments. In other words, uh, programs where beneficiaries receive payments should they meet certain conditions. For example, uh, payments to Erasmus students, direct aid to farmers, budget support to third countries and EU staff salaries. These entitlement-based payments represented more than half of payments from the EU budget in 2017. Furthermore, the irregularities in EU spending has continued, have continued to fall. The estimated error rate for payments in 2017 was 2.4%. In 2016, it was 3.1%, and in 2015, it was 3.8%. This shows that the financial management of the EU is definitely moving in the right direction, and for that, we must pay tribute to the ongoing efforts by the Commission and the Member States, and, of course, uh, we should say to the Parliament uh, in its control activities and the activities of the Court of Auditors. I believe that as auditors we should not always be those who bear bad news, but we should also uh, point the finger to good practice where we find it. So let me give you a positive example in direct payments under the European Agricultural Guarantee Fund, which is a very large proportion of that MFF heading. These direct uh, payments were an area where we uh, concluded that there was no material error. That said, I also have to bring to your attention that some problems remain. To clarify what I mean, I'm going to give you three examples, one from another area of agricultural spending, one from cohesion, and the third is from research. We came across a case where a farmer had received environmental support to plant something known as catch crops. In actual fact, 
no such crops had been planted and there was no register of irrigation or cultivation activities. As a result, the National Paying Agency, following our visit, launched a procedure to recover that payment. In another case, we found that a beneficiary under cohesion had over-declared indirect costs. These costs, in actual fact, were general overheads that uh, were incurred at the headquarters of the institution and they did not have anything to do with the specific body set up to implement the project. We regarded all costs that weren't directly related to the project as ineligible for support. In a third case, an SME involved in a research project had used the wrong method uh, to calculate hours spent on the project and incorrectly calculated them. And to make matters worse, the staff were in fact employed by a sister company which was not party to the grant contract and therefore we regarded those costs as ineligible. And uh, you will find a plethora of other examples that we enumerate in our report. At this juncture, I'd like to emphasize that very often there is adequate information to prevent, detect and correct a significant proportion of errors. If the Commission and the national authorities had used this information, then an even larger proportion of the EU budget would have fallen under our materiality threshold. And what we discovered, others could have discovered too. But we cannot leave it at that. Management and control systems have improved. And that now gives us an opportunity to rethink how these improvements uh, can contribute audit evidence. For 2017, in economic, social and territorial cohesion, we have uh, trialled a new approach. And the key change is that we reviewed and re-ran the checks and controls that were carried out by those responsible for the spending. This new approach to audit takes into account important changes to the legal basis adopted by Parliament and Council in 2013, applicable to the current spending period. Consequently, we are now auditing declared expenditure where Member States and the Commission have already applied financial corrections as a result of irregularities thrown up, and therefore our audit findings make it clearer where there are deficiencies both at Commission and in the Member States and enable us to give you in the Parliament higher calibre information. We will roll that approach out to other areas of spending in the year to come where the necessary preconditions exist. But we'll also have to focus our attention and resources on establishing whether the EU is capable of delivering results. It's not enough simply to know that the money has been spent properly. We also need to throw into relief whether the money has been spent uh, sensibly. Let me give you another example, and this is from the field of foreign policy. Um, one of the projects we looked at, an international organization had in cost, costs of uh, more than 280,000 euros to transport ballot boxes and papers that were worth 150,000 euros. Now, this was a third country, and admittedly, it was a sensitive and urgent affair. Nonetheless, it is difficult to justify to citizens that the EU is spending their taxpayers' money in this way. So, ladies and gentlemen, in one of our most recent special reports, we have demonstrated that a number of member states have difficulties in using the money from the European Structural and Investment Funds properly. And in that respect, it is to be welcomed that the Commission is proposing a batch of measures for the next financial period, which could lead to better absorption of cohesion funding. Some of the solution, however, is in your hands, namely by adopting the new MFF in good time the multi-annual financial uh, framework. At the same time, the EU budget is under considerable pressure uh, for the time to come because of the high value of the payments uh, 
The combination of high commitments and low payments has uh, led to an increase in the outstanding commitments of the EU with a new high of 267.3 billion. And our predictions are that the rows will continue to rise by the end of 2020. And we think that absolutely must be a priority for the next MFF. In the dispute between net payers who want to reduce commitments and net beneficiaries who are calling for more commitment, the Court of Auditors uh, will not um, become involved. Nonetheless, we can point to the fact that the increasing volume of outstanding commitments uh, will be pushed further forward into the future as a result of the programmes that you are now negotiating. Ladies and gentlemen, the total EU budget amounts to only around 1% of the gross national income of the EU as a whole. It is important that EU funding is spent effectively. And at the same time, nonetheless, we have to be realistic about what we can achieve with the money entrusted to us. If we create expectations that we cannot fulfill, then once again we will reduce uh, levels of trust. We don't think the EU should be making promises it cannot deliver. And every day we have to demonstrate that competencies allotted to the EU level are more effectively exercised than they would be at national level. Let me just say something before I conclude. Auditors have a reputation for always looking to the past, but this year I think we are entitled to look to the future too. In the weeks to come, a number of opinions will be emanating from us regarding the EU's financing in the 2021 to 2027 period. The Parliament and Council have important decisions to make. We categorically welcome the fact that the Commission has laid the groundwork for more flexibility, something that the current MFF sorely lacks. This is certainly a step in the right direction. Ladies and gentlemen, as we navigate through an increasingly choppy sea, let's ensure that our decisions are based on a firm financial footing. We need to be able to demonstrate to our citizens that we can deliver our promises and do so efficiently and in a way that actually makes a difference. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to our exchange of views. Mr Lazarou and I myself are very happy to answer any questions you may care to ask. Thank you.